bunch of old men out here. You can't expect us to do anything hard. I was hoping they wouldn't find me. What you've been looking at is that very special part of baseball life called spring training. Now that's the time when every team's training camp is filled with hope and phenoms. Now, unfortunately, most of the time, neither the hopes nor the phenoms last too long. Hi, I'm Joe Garagiola, and I'm going to be your host for what we call baseball, fun and games. Now, when you have a title like that, where do you really start? Well, we could do what Casey Stengel did in his very first spring training meeting with the very first New York Mets team he ever gathered. He got them all around him for a meeting. He looked at them for a minute, and then he held up his hand and said, gentlemen, this is a baseball. Do you know four guys didn't know what that was? Any discussion of baseball now has to start with the pitcher. Now, there are some people, I know that, like my former managers and teammates of mine, I'll guarantee you, if you run into them, they're going to tell you, the only thing he knows about pitching is that it's tough to hit. Well, that's not quite accurate. I proved the theory in baseball. I proved that it was tough to hit. But I do know some of the basic things about pitching, and I would like to illustrate some of them for you. For example, I knew of a pitcher. Now, keep in mind, when a catcher signals a pitcher, it's one for a fastball, two for a curve. That's pretty basic. Three for a slider or four for a knuckleball, okay? One fastball, two curve. This pitcher, he had real good curveball. I mean, it was spinning good, but his fastball didn't have much on it. Finally, the catcher calls time, goes out to him, says, what's the matter? Your curveball's breaking good, but your fastball, you don't have too much on it. You know what the pitcher said? He said, call for that two-finger ball. I can get a better grip. Can you imagine if he'd have called for a five-finger ball? So the basic thing is the grip. Learn to grip the ball properly. That's what you have to do. And then, of course, we all know the importance of good balance. And most important of all is control. Sometimes, if you're having control problems, a good idea is to take just a little bit off your fastball. Hitters, too, have basics that big leaguers all follow, like good balance, for example. And, of course, a good grip is essential for a big league. What you're looking at are some examples of what the late Mr. Branch Ricky used to call the purpose pitch. And the purpose was to separate your head from your shoulder. That was the purpose. And some guys take these things personally. Why do pitchers knock down hitters? I tell you, they got a lot of reasons. Home runs, for one thing. Home runs really upset pitchers. Now, I can remember when I was with the Pittsburgh Pirates. Ralph Kiner batted fourth, Gus Bell batted fifth, I batted sixth. That's the kind of club we had. I mean, that tells you something about the parts of 52 if I bat sixth. But anyhow, Ralph Kiner would come up batting fourth, home run. Gus Bell would come up, home run. You know who the pitcher would knock down? The next hitter, me. Why? Why would he knock me down? I didn't hit the home run. I mean, I'm still going to hit my 200, right? But he was upset, so down you went. They say Burley Grimes would knock down hitters just for swinging hard. And Early Wynn's got a reputation, or had one when he was playing, at least, that he would knock his mother down. You know what he said? Sure I would. She was a good hitter. And Dizzy Dean's pet peeve, if I heard him say it once, I heard him say it a million times. His pet peeve was the hitter who would come up, and I mean, really dig in. You've seen those guys really dig in, get a good toe hole. Old Diz would holler from the mound, dig yourself a deep one, sonny boy, because old Diz is going to bury you in it. Now, baseball is like other sports in the fact that most people do overlook the importance of defense. Me, I am partial to well-executed defensive plays in baseball. And so, here are some more basics to keep in mind. The first rule for an outfielder is to get under the ball. And when you catch it, squeeze it. For infield, it's easy if you just get in front of the ball. Once you've got the ball, make a good, accurate throw. 
Outfielders sometimes have the problem of running out of ballpark. And of course, take good care of your equipment. No ball, no glove. To some people, baseball is a game of numbers, but to me, it's always been a game of names. Numbers mean numbers, but names, names mean people. And some funny things happen to baseball names. Babe Ruth, for example, called almost everyone Judge because he was so bad at remembering names. And Casey Stengel could remember them. Casey's problem was pronouncing them. He always called his catcher, Chris Canizero, Canzanari. And later, we're going to show you an umpire and a manager in an argument. And this is not stage. I mean a real argument. And the umpire keeps calling the manager by the wrong name. Now, why am I talking about names? Let me tell you. Have you ever noticed how every time one baseball fan meets another, they seem to challenge each other with questions? I know what happens to me. It's got to happen to you. So since I'm a baseball fan and you are too, I've got some questions to put to you. Now, not going to be too tough. I mean, these to start with. Just something to get us going, okay? Now, in each case, what I'm looking for is a name. Ready? What we're looking at is one of the most famous catches in World Series history. Now, the man who made it is Ron Swoboda of the New York Mets. The Baltimore player who hit the ball was named Robinson. Your question, was Mr. Robinson's first name Brooks or Frank? Okay, write down the answer. Before we leave that outfield in Shea Stadium, let's look at two more plays. This one came with two men on and two out. This one came three innings later with the bases loaded and two out. So in both cases, the base runners were going. Question, who made those two catches? And this was one of the most exciting moments I ever broadcast. It's the 12th inning of the sixth game of the 1975 World Series. Now, the Cincinnati Reds had already won three games, so Boston had to win or go home. And with one swing of the bat and some body English boy that would have made some pinball players real happy, the Red Sox won the game. And since I said in the beginning that these would be easy, I'm only going to ask you to name the man that hit the home run. But if you'd like a real challenge right here, tell me, who was the pitcher? Now you're about to see two outfielders share a section of fence and a catch. But these two share something else, too. Only five players in Major League history have combined 30 home runs and 30 stolen bases in the same year. And you're looking at two of them. Who are they? Okay, here are the answers. Ron Swoboda made this great catch on Brooks Robinson. And the man who goes so fast and so far to both his left and his right is Tommy A.G. The home run was hit by Carlton Fisk, and I'm sure you had that. But the pitcher, it was Pat Darcy. And the two great hitters who ran into each other one afternoon in Candlestick Park, Willie Mays and Bobby Bonds. No part of baseball sounds simpler or causes so much confusion as running the bases. Something seems to be so complicated about running from one base to the next. I remember when I was with the Pittsburgh Pirates. I'm on third base one day, and that was strange territory for me. Now, let's pretend this is third, and second base is over there, okay? And I'm standing here, and I look down there, and there's Brandy Davis, teammate. I know he's a teammate because he was in a team picture with me. I see him in the clubhouse. He's got Pittsburgh across there. He's one of my guys, right? I'm here at third. He's at second. He's got a big lead, and all of a sudden, here he comes. And I mean, he's running. All of a sudden, great slide right in front of me, right here. And I said, Brandy, where are you going? He said, back to second if I can make it. You talk about us being confused. You should have seen those infielders. 
Anyway, I want you to remember one thing as we look at some rundown plays. Now, the baseball experts, you know, the geniuses, they'll tell you that in a properly executed rundown, the ball is thrown only once. You only throw the ball once, that's all. Now the rundown begins. One throw. Two. Three. Four. And he's safe. But he's safe. On this rundown play, only one throw is made. But to the wrong guy. The key word in this rundown play is unnecessary. There's a force play at third. In this rundown, the accent is on the run. Now they got him trapped. I'll get him. No, I'll get the other guy. He's going to run all the way. Just think if he was paid by the mob. He got the job done. Stolen base. He's... Did somebody yell foul ball? They did. They were lying because now he's in a rundown. He's out. And there are some plays you just don't practice. Enough for a meeting. Baseball is touch all the bases. Got to touch the last base. Dang, missed it. No question about it. And speaking of questions, let's try some more. Now these will be a little tougher, but still not that tough. Simple questions with simple answers. I like that combination. It's like when somebody asked Houston infielder Ernie Fazio why he had switched bats. See, Ernie was using a 34-ounce bat, and he switched to a 31-ounce bat. And he could have given a lot of reasons, like he was getting jammed with the fastball or the slider was getting to him. But he said, very simply, I switched from a 34-ounce bat to a 31-ounce bat because it's lighter to carry back to the bench when I strike out. And when Fred Patek was asked how he liked being the smallest player in the major leagues, Patek said, it's a lot better than being the smallest player in the minor leagues. See what I mean? Simple questions, simple answers. Now it's your turn. In 1961, Yankee left-hander Whitey Ford topped off the best year of his career by breaking the old record for a consecutive scoreless innings in World Series play of 29 and two-thirds innings. Our first question is, what pitcher held the record that Whitey Ford broke? In 1968, Detroit's Denny McLean became the first major league pitcher in 34 years to be a 30-game winner. His 31 and 6 year led the Tigers into the World Series. But in that World Series, McLean found himself upstaged by a teammate. What was his name? In 1964, Bobby Richardson of the Yankees set a World Series record by getting 13 hits, even though his team lost. Four years later, Richardson's record was tied. 
oddly enough, by a player who played against Richardson when the record was set. Who was he? The first man ever to win two Most Valuable Player awards was the great Philadelphia A's slugger, Jimmy Fox, who did it in 1932 and 1933. Others have done it since, but only one man has ever won the award in both major leagues. Can you name him? Because the 1954 Cleveland Indians won so many games, 111, and had four top pitchers in Bob Lemon, Early Wynn, Mike Garcia, and Bob Feller, some people think that the Indians pitching staff that year had four 20-game winners. But only Lemon and Wynn won that many. Only one team in history had four 20-game winners. Can you name the team and the pitchers? In 1955, 20-year-old Al Kaline became the youngest player ever to win a batting title. He was several months younger than another Tiger immortal, Ty Cobb, who won it in 1907, also at age 20. Your question is, who was the oldest player ever to win a batting championship? Okay, now it's time for the answers. The pitcher whose record was broken by Whitey Ford was a former Red Sox left-hander who went on to break the hearts of lots of pitchers later on. His name was Babe Ruth. The teammate who upstaged Denny McLean in the 1968 World Series was left-hander Mickey Lolich. In that World Series, McLean had a record of one victory and two defeats. Lolich won all three of his starts. Lou Brock of the St. Louis Cardinals played against Bobby Richardson when Richardson set his record. And four years later, against Detroit, Brock tied that record. Like Richardson, though, he did it in a losing cause. The only club that had four 20-game winners the same year was the 1971 Baltimore Orioles. The pitchers were Jim Palmer, Dave McNally, Mike Cuellar, and Pat Dobson. In 1961, Frank Robinson won the Most Valuable Player Award in the National League while playing for the Cincinnati Reds. Five years later, he became the first player ever to win that honor in both leagues when his triple crown year led the Baltimore Orioles to the pennant. And finally, we come to the oldest man ever to win a batting championship, the splendid splinter, Ted Williams. Williams hit 328 in 1958 when he was 40 years old. That was 17 years after he had hit 406 but only one year after he had, at age 39, hit a remarkable 388. Sometimes people ask me how I got along with umpires. I think we got along all right. See, I learned early. It was my rookie year with the Cardinals, 1946. And I said something to umpire Larry Getz about a pitch that I thought he should have called a strike. And he stopped me cold, I mean right now. And then he spent the next three innings really lecturing me. And his lecture was pretty simple. He kept telling me that I was having enough trouble catching without trying to umpire, too. And I mean, he pounded me. And finally, I had to beg. Let me up, Larry. Let me up. I'm not saying another word. And after that experience, all I did as a catcher was offer some suggestions. You know, just try to help out. See, sometimes it just takes a little thing to get an argument started with an umpire. Let me tell you about one argument. I'm catching, OK? Dewey Williams is the hitter. Dewey was a catcher with the Cubs. Beans Reardon is behind the plate. Now, Dewey, he gets run out of the game, and all he asked was one simple question. I thought it was an interesting question. His timing was bad, I'll grant you that, OK? Dewey's up there hitting. Beans is behind the plate. I'm catching. Two balls, two strikes. Here comes a pitch across here. Beans says strike three. Dewey didn't do anything except turn around and ask this question. And again, I thought it was a good one. 
He said, Beans, how can you get a square head in a round mask? And Beans got mad. Now, usually it takes more than something like that to get an umpire upset. have a special word for umpires, and when they say it, the umpire will ask him to leave. There goes Gene Mock, and there's the old major, Ralph Howe, past master. <laughs> Betty takes his hat off. Boy. Earl Weaver will turn his around so he doesn't peck the umpire. Said the magic word. Billy Hunter, take your hat off, Bill. Now. Throw your hat, Chuck. Dick Williams will make a speech. Herman Franks, he's a kicker. Here's Earl Weaver again. Do your thing, Earl. Go. Larry Doby is even pious. He'll kneel. And Gene Mock. Give it one more kick, Mage. One more. Bill Clem once described an umpire's job as being one where the greatest applause you can get is silence. And Larry Getz once said, on every close play, there might be 30,000 people making a decision, but mine is the only one that counts. Now I want you to try your hand at umpiring. Now you won't have to put up with bench jockeys or even getting booed, but you might come up with a little better idea of an umpire's job because starting right now, the umpire is you. Now playing umpires do more than call balls and strikes. There's going to be a play at the plate, and you have to call the runner safe or out. And what do you say? Is he safe or is he out? It was the 1973 World Series, and umpire Augie Donatelli called Bud Harrelson out. Willie Mays pleaded, but it didn't help. But now let's hear from the manager, and in this case, it's my old friend, Yogi Berra. Nice try, Yog, but I never really thought much of your chances. Let's look at another play at home plate. Now, the question here is, does he score or doesn't he score? What do you think?
1968 World Series. The runner is the speedy Lou Brock. Willie Horton is the Detroit left fielder, and his throw to catcher Bill Freehan and Brock both arrive at home plate at the same time. Does he score? No, says the umpire. And of course, we've got an argument. Brock said he did touch it. But a closer look shows that Bill Freehan had him blocked. He was out. Here the question is not just safe or out. It's tougher than that. You have to decide whether the batter interferes with the catcher. Does he interfere? Tenth inning, third game, 1975 World Series. The batter is Cincinnati's Ed Armbrister, and the catcher is Boston's Carlton Fisk. The decision is no interference. Boston manager Daryl Johnson is not too happy. You tell me what's more common than what he said. Usually you don't have tag plays at first base, but here's one. Now is the runner safe or out? It's the 1970 All-Star game. Joe Torre grounds to Brooks Robinson, who makes the long throw to Carl Yastrzemski. The umpire says, out. Another close play at first base for you to call. Is the runner safe or out? In the 1970 World Series, Brooks Robinson held a clinic on how to play third base. Did he get him? Yes, in time. Lee May is out. This one is a classic. Your job seems to be simple. Is he safe? Ah. Cincinnati against Baltimore. Ty Klein facing Jim Palmer. Now I call this a classic because the runner, the catcher, and the umpire are all wrong. The catcher doesn't have the ball in the glove, the runner misses the plate, and the umpire is out of position. But the call is out. 1970 World Series. Bernie Carbo is the runner. Ellie Hendricks is the catcher. The umpire is Ken Burkhardt. Now here comes Sparky Anderson out. Now remember that, because Burkhardt keeps calling him Danny. We were right here, and he knocked two over and went around. There's no way possible, Kenny. You never, there's no way you can even see the Danny, play. I said he tagged him. How could you see if he tagged him, Kenny, when you were knocked out? Huh? <laughs> Kenny, no. Kenny, you we were knocked out. How can you call him out? I said he tagged him. But Danny, that's it. The pitchers do all tell that. I promise you that. What starts out as a double steal winds up in a sly play at the plate for you to call. Is he safe or out? Nineteen seventy two American League playoff. Reggie Jackson's the runner. He'll end up this play with a full muscle. 
He'll also score the winning run because the umpire calls him safe. And you'll notice that umpire is a little easier when you have replay, slow motion, and some stop action. Baseball has always had its share of colorful fans. Remember Hilda Chester? Hilda was in Brooklyn and she'd always ring a cowbell. Then it was Marriott in St. Louis with a voice that every player in the league knew. And I might add, you heard it in your dreams. And there were two brothers in Philadelphia. Boy, do I remember them. They used to really get on the ball players. One of them would sit on the first base side, the other guy on the third base side. They were my introduction to stereo. Of course, there were celebrity fans, too, like Bill Bojangles Robinson, who used to tap dance on top of the dugout to bring his favorite team some luck. But lately, we've seen something new in the category of fans. some problems with the questions I asked you earlier, you get one more chance right here. But I got to tell you now, these are tougher than the others. In fact, these are the kind that you can have some fun with. You know that friend of yours who claims that he knows all the answers to all the baseball questions? I'll tell you what you do. After you're through with these, invite him over and see how he does. Billy Martin is remembered for this key catch that he made on a pop fly in the 1952 World Series. Chances are you've seen this footage a lot of times. But can you tell me who hit the ball that Billy caught? Now some questions about my kind of guys. I'm talking about guys that come off the bench for their moment in baseball history. 
One of the most famous games ever was in the 1947 World Series. Yankee pitcher Bill Bevins was within one out of a no-hitter when Cookie Lavagetto's pinch hit scored two runs and not only broke up the no-hitter, but won the game for the Dodgers. Your question? Name the pinch runner who scored the winning run. Ted Williams sure doesn't qualify as a guy who came off the bench. So your question is, name the one player in Major League history who was able to say that he pinch hit for Ted Williams. Another guy who didn't have much experience with people pinch hitting for him was Harry Walker. But in 1948, the year that Harry the Hat led the National League in hitting, he was pinch hit for once, and by a pitcher at that. Can you name the pitcher? We all know that the most famous home run in baseball history was hit by Bobby Thompson, and it won the 1951 pennant for the New York Giants. And we all know that the pitcher was Brooklyn's Ralph Branca. But your question is, who was in the on-deck circle? Who was the next scheduled hitter after Bobby Thompson? Okay, now it's time for the answer. The player who hit the famous pop fly that Billy Martin caught was Jackie Robinson. In the fourth game of the 1947 World Series, the winning run was scored by pinch runner Eddie Mixes. The only man who can say that he once pinch hit for Ted Williams is Carol Hardy. See, the Red Sox came from way behind in the ninth inning, and Williams was already undressing in the clubhouse. So Hardy got his chance at immortality. The pitcher who once pinch hit for batting champion Harry Walker was schoolboy Rowe who was really a pretty good hitter in his own right. If Bobby Thompson had not driven in the winning run when he did in that final game of the 1951 playoff, the next scheduled batter was a rookie named Willie Mays. And now for a bonus question. Name the 20-year-old catcher who got four hits in one game in the 1946 World Series. I'm gonna give you a clue. You're not only looking at him, you're listening to him. You mean no way. I did get four hits in one game in that World Series. And as a late Casey Stengel liked to say, you could look it up. One of the most famous cliches in sports is the one that says, footballs take funny bounces. Now, I don't disagree with that, but let's take a look at some of the bounces a baseball can take. Or a baseball player, for that matter.
describe what kind of baseball fan you are? I mean, do you like high-scoring games or pitchers' battles? Do you like every game you see or only the ones where your team wins? Do you like fast games or slow ones? I've tried to pick categories for myself, but I really can't. I really can't. And what I can do is tell you and show you the kind of things I like to see in a ball game. Now, some of these I was in the ballpark to see. The others I saw on television or in films. But here are some plays I'd like to see again. And I think they'll tell you something about my feelings about baseball. In baseball, you can never take anything for granted. As Norm Cash, the Detroit first baseman, finds out right here. Now, he did everything right. Except he forgot to tag the runner. Now, here it's the batter who took something for granted, and he was wrong, too. The batter tried to be an umpire. He called it foul, but the third base umpire says fair. To the pitcher, to first base, 5-1-3 if you're scoring. Now, this is either a great defensive effort, or he left something in his locker. Let me just set your mind at rest. Butch Hobson of the Red Sox didn't get hurt on that play. Watch it. See you later, Butch. Everybody's going down to see where he went. It's not how far you hit the ball. It's how far you can run before the other team gets control of it. Now, this bunt gets exciting. He throws it in the right field. So the man on first, he's going to try to score all the way. Of course, the infielder's going to try to get him. But he throws it past the catcher. The man who bunted the ball, here he comes. Two runs score on a bunt. This is one of my real favorites. Larry Bittner, diving catch. Where'd it go? It's in his hat. Get it. Watch how perfect that ball lands in his hat. It's in your hat, Larry, your hat. Here is a valuable lesson. Listen to the umpire. He didn't listen. Now he's out. On this play, outfielder Pat Kelly is credited with a different kind of assist. He turns a fly ball into a home run. Now in basketball, they call that a tip-in. But in baseball, that's a no-no. Here is Steve Hamilton and the pitch he made famous, the Folly Floater. Tony Horton fouls it off. Of course, everybody's enjoying it. And Horton asks for it again. Will Steve Hamilton throw another Folly Floater? We shall see. In slow motion yet. And he pops it up. Munson makes a great running catch. And watch Horton's reaction now. There goes the helmet. What do you want me to do? Talk about frustration. Now here is Lou Brock. And he hits what looks to be an inside the park home run. Deep right center field great speed. It just needs one little touch. It needs Brock to touch home plate. Get him. Got him. Now here we're going to see Brock finishing his 360-foot trip, and then he goes into his imitation of Fred Astaire. Do it. In the beginning, we told you this was going to be called Baseball 
fun and games. Well, you saw a lot of plays from a lot of games, and we sure hope you had some fun. That's what baseball is all about. It's like Willie Stargell says. Willie says, the umpire doesn't say work ball, he says play ball. So you're supposed to have fun. Well, I had fun playing ball, and I had fun with this show. And like I said, I hope you did too. I'll see you at the ballpark.